Welcome to episode 9 of The Reading Cure. In this episode, we'll be discussing the book The Wisdom of Insecurity by Alan Watts. Welcome to The Reading Cure, a podcast where we take a deep dive into some great books focusing on their insights for our mental health. My name is Dr Stephen Davis and my co-host is Dr Alexander Fox. So let me begin with a quote from our featured author for this week, the philosopher Alan Watts. In his iconic book, The Wisdom of Insecurity, he says, This is the human problem. There is a price to be paid for every increase in consciousness. We cannot be more sensitive to pleasure without being more sensitive to pain. By remembering the past, we can plan for the future, but the ability to plan for pleasure is often offset by the ability to dread pain and to fear the unknown. Furthermore, the growth of an acute sense of the past and the future gives us a correspondingly dim sense of the present. In other words, we seem to reach a point where the advantages of being conscious are outweighed by its disadvantages where extreme sensitivity makes us unadaptable. Alan Watts was an English-American philosopher, writer and public speaker. Throughout his life, he was a voracious reader and original thinker who loved to probe into deep philosophical and even mystical ideas from both Eastern and Western spiritual traditions. Watts moved from Kent, England to the United States in 1938 at the age of 23 to study Zen Buddhism in New York. However, after becoming somewhat disillusioned with formal Buddhist practice, he became an Episcopalian priest in 1945. In 1950, Watts again left this religious institution and moved to California, where he joined the faculty of the American Academy of Asian Studies. He would go on to embark upon his acclaimed public lecture tours, in which he shared his learning and interpretation of Eastern thought for American and then European audiences. Watts wrote more than 25 books and articles on religion and philosophy, introducing the emerging counterculture to Zen Buddhist ideas in particular. He saw Eastern spiritual thought as neither akin to Western religion nor philosophy, but rather as more closely related to the emerging field of psychotherapy. Watts would go on to live in Druid Heights, a bohemian community and spiritual retreat in California, which became a hotbed of counterculture thought and spiritual practice. So, first question then, Alex. So, Alan Watts depicts a division within us that that language and abstract thinking seem to impart via culture and upbringing. Um, I'm wondering, what do you see as the key features of this inner sense of division or alienation that that Watts thinks that people have? I think that this is an interesting point. I I kind of would see it as uh, not only connected to culture and upbringing, but actually the nature and function of abstract thinking in language. Um, You know, in the philosophy of knowledge, known as epistemology, uh, there's often this idea that uh, we talk about a subject and an object, a knower and a known. And so you could see that uh, to know something is, in some sense, to step back from it and observe it and uh, try and to its properties. So there is this kind of division. You know, the subject is not the object. The object is not the subject. And so I think Watts kind of sees that as a sort of fracturing of the world, a kind of alienation from it because to know something is in a sense to step back from it not to be immersed in it to be apart from it to observe it and there is a kind of inherent alienation or division uh, in that and you know he also connects this to how our mind might know our bodies say he he, he talks about that in one of his chapters and for people that know a little bit about philosophy that would go back to Descartes you know the mind and the body being seen as de- you know different things the mind can know the body but the mind is not the body and for someone like Watts that is a an unhealthy separation you know a, a break uh, or a rupture in the kind of organic unity that he believes we actually do possess 
So I think it is part of the nature of abstract thinking too. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting perspective. Actually, there you've just described. I think that that does um, that does seem to be what he's saying. I think you're right. It's something as fundamental as that that at this level of just perception, whereby we are separated internally in our you know in our minds in terms of from the, the yeah the objects of perception. And, and inevitably, there is a fraction there. I guess that um, you know we have to experience in order to to function. But but yet. You know, this uh, this sense of alienation might unfortunately be the inevitable result of that. That that Watts thinks, you know, maybe we we have to then try to remedy, despite maybe the initial fracture being being inevitable. Um, well, I, I yes, know. yeah. I mean, you know, philosophers like Heidegger, who wrote about being in the world, you know, this idea that um, our inherent nature is is to be in the world, to be part of the world, to be made of the world rather than being separate from it in that sort of knower and knowing kind of way and so I think what Watts was talking about in terms of that inherent unity um, that that world of experience is kind of similar in some regards to Heidegger's notion of being in the world um, the yeah. even though he doesn't obviously mention Heidegger um, and so you know what we'd be talking about is embodied knowledge you know so knowledge is actually uh, arising out of our experience and isn't uh, a product of a sort of separation from our experience Definitely. I think I think you're onto something there. I mean, certainly it struck me, you know, in the earlier sections of the book, he talks a lot about our consciousness, you know, and, and this mm -hmm. idea that the more we have, I guess, w what you could say on the one hand is a higher levels of consciousness in terms of greater sensitivity, you know, maybe greater yeah. abstract capabilities to identify different uh, things or think about different kinds of concepts. You know, with that, it's like we, we pay a really steep price for what yes. um, there, there was one quote he had which was he, he said consciousness seems to be nature's ingenious mode of self-torture and it's and uh, yeah I think as you're describing it's like the more we can be abstract and in that observer role yeah the more we're not what we're not doing is knowing in a bodily sense I guess it's more you know it's in that purely intellectual sense which um, he, he seems to be suggesting here comes with quite a quite a price you know it's a bit like the more you can feel pleasure including intellectual pleasure or the more you can be sensitive to what's happening the more you can also suffer the pain that, that comes yes, with that yeah with that power i guess yes um, well i mean that that's very true and it, it connects with one of the the fundamental points that watts wants to make in this book because in the preface to the wisdom of insecurity he talks about what he calls the backwards law and basically it's this kind of paradox that the more that you uh, try to obtain something that you think is ostensibly positive, the more that you might actually uh, create inadvertently a negative outcome. And I think what he's saying when it comes to something like language and consciousness is that he makes the nuanced point that these things have evident advantages. Yeah. Uh, the fact that we're capable of abstract thought means that we can recognize patterns in our experience. And patterns then means that we can predict things with greater accuracy. Um, we can see similarities between things that seem disparate on a more concrete level and we can then understand and attempt to master the world in that way and so there are some benefits there but the downside as you say is that um, we become more alienated or divided or separated from the present moment because the yes. more we're predicting uh, through our abstract cogitations the more we we could be alienated from the present we become i think what he's he's expressing which is a real concern is that you know we become so uh future dominated that we don't actually live and i think I, that's I think... probably his most fundamental point there is that if we're not living we can only live in the present and if we get so focused on abstractions and so focused on building some allegedly secure future we will never actually f live or we will never fully live I, com I completely agree with you yeah i mean it struck me reading 
particularly the early sections, you know, he emphasises the role of, of our sense of being in time. Yeah. Um, and obviously you've, you were referring to Heidegger before yes. there. And, you know, that's something maybe in a, wee, in a second you'll be able to, you know, elucidate more the possible connections with, with that perspective. But certainly, yeah, the, the sort of, I think he talks about, isn't it, the combination of our, both our memory, you know, of, of what's gone before and our foresight, you know, having these two capabilities, which as you suggested, mm. makes us very effective beings and makes us do lots of helpful, productive things, means living in a kind of conscious state of, of fluctuation between past and future. Yeah. And the, the, the trap being you never stop, you know, you never actually just kind of tune into the now, but potentially or don't do it often enough and everything becomes about expectation of what may or may not happen and yeah it's a very disembodied and kind of ungrounded way to be psychologically I guess that's that's maybe what he's he's getting at here I think yes yeah I mean ungrounded is a a good metaphorical way of putting it in in the sense that you don't have your feet on the ground you're not you're not uh, tangibly immersed or or um anchored in the present no. and this is a this is a real concern for watts because he's saying we can only live in the present yeah. uh, we only experience the present the the future is only tangible because it then becomes the 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 present uh there i think in terms of heidegger as far as what i've read of heidegger so far that um you know, his focus is on becoming and on a project, you know, like each uh, individual Dasein, as he calls it, uh, human being is is got a notion of what it wants to become. So it is more future orientated than what Watts is, is, is talking about, okay. I think. Um, yeah. sure. there, I think that what Watts is kind of you know, focused on as a corrective to this to this notion that um, that the you know we should be future oriented. We should always be trying to build or construct things because I mean that's what security is about. So, you know, achieving security would mean building something or trying to achieve something that that gives you that security. So it's hard not to be future oriented if you're searching for security what watts is saying is that that security is elusive it's not actually what you would want anyway he argues and what it does is it takes you away from the pulse of life which could only be felt in the present i mean another way of looking at it is that what he is really kind of cautioning us is not to treat the present purely in an instrumental way in other words as a means to achieve something else because yeah. then there'll be this this um indefinite deferment of enjoyment because you know if you're always seeing the present moment as leading on to something better it, that continues on and you never end up enjoying intrinsically the present Definitely. Well, I mean, he uses the, the example, you know, maybe of people who work in business, for example, that they have, if, if, you know, if they're in a, a business where there are a lot, there are lots of plans to make, they've got to keep thinking about how future earnings are going to come. He, he describes that as basically not earning a living, but earning an earning, because yeah. you're always at the preparation stage. You never, when do you ever actually stop and just enjoy, you know, and it's a kind yeah. of obvious point in a way but there is but but yet maybe there is something about the kind of working life and or, or even even going beyond work when people think about other future plans during their, their leisure time as well that they can just fall out the way of the the just straightforward being i guess that's what he's trying to bring us back to i think isn't it well it is yeah and yeah. this ties in with a book that we might look at it at one point walter Kerr's decline of pleasure where he oh yes yeah where he obviously talks about um we've become so utilitarian in our focus. And the thing about the utilitarian mindset is that you couldn't really intrinsically enjoy, enjoy the present because it would only be seen as a means to something else and so on and so forth. And so I think what Watts was saying, he didn't put it in this way, but he was trying to encourage us to to enjoy the present, be anchored in the present in this non-utilitarian way. Whereas as the, the example you gave and that he offers himself of the businessman is that what's happening in the present is only seen as a means to further income and so on and so on. And it, and, um, and it becomes obsessive. You're chasing something that you can never actually have. 
uh, there. And yet his argument is that if you turn to the present, uh, if you open yourself through awareness to the present, there is this sort of gold there to be found. Absolutely, yeah. I mean that the the care books a good a good parallel actually to draw because I think I mean he he talks in that book about the idea that, that people seem to have gotten very guilty. I mean, obviously he was writing decades ago, but even yeah. back then, you know, the idea that people would you know certain people who were maybe more of what you could call the aspirational type. Yeah. It was a bit like an evening doing not very much was like time wasted because you yes. could have been achieving so much. You know, that could have been preparation for some future achievement. But yeah, what could be very toxic about that way of thinking is that well what's all the achievement for actually just just to achieve to have more achievements you know it does it there needs to be some kind of sense of reconnecting with with life in a, in a more passive way actually in order to be well, a balanced yes. person you know yeah um, well I, th- I think this is um where watts and care converge in some ways is that both of them are saying that if you treat the present, which is Watts's emphasis, and for care, it's leisure time. But they're yeah. kind of similar in terms of the enjoying this this present moment. If you, if you treat it as a, a means to something else, then you end up treating everything as a tool, and that you yourself become a tool. Mm, really, yeah. you then end up objectifying and. And reifying yourself to the point that you become disassociated from your feelings. Um, You end up becoming a means to an end yourself. Um, And so that is part of the danger of that mindset. Definitely, yeah. It's, I think that's right, isn't it? That um, I mean, it was, at some point in the book, Watts talks about neuro- neurotis, or in his yeah. understanding of the word neurotic, which he applies to people that are suffering from that as you said that per- perpetual state of being in a utilitarian mindset which is a kind of anti-life way to be actually because um because yeah there, there there's 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 no sense of recharging there's no sense of either leisure or or just contentment um so yeah it's it's well yes it is it, there there is and and um you know, Watts talks about in quite spiritual terms of being reborn in the present, whereas Care is kind of talking about it in a more kind of secular way because he talks about recreation as recreation. So the idea of being able to identify and immerse yourself in something inherently pleasurable for care that is is recreation you're recreating yourself you're reaffirming yourself watts is saying something similar but he's actually seeing it in a wider way because he also includes what we would ordinarily call negative emotions in this as well okay yeah um this is one of the things we maybe talk about that later on in terms of mental yeah, health yeah. but but yeah. as you know from reading the book that that watts um believes that uh, we should be anchored in our feelings, in our experiencing of the moment, whether it is what would conventionally be called positive or negative feelings. Yes, exactly. That's, I think that's a very good point. I mean, for, for what's, and I, as you said, we'll, we'll come to this a little bit later, yeah. but essentially the solution to everything for, for what's is essentially being present and just experiencing whatever yeah. it may be, positive or negative. Yeah, that's that's to him is, yeah. is the kind of key that unlocks the door to sort of a, a meaningful life, actually. Well, you know, it, that's, well, it that's is. The, um, the route. Um, I well, wonder, what I would just, before you sure, go on yeah, to the next sure. point, I just want mm-hmm. to address a little bit about the language aspect, you know, here about the alienation that he believes comes with language. Obviously, um as they used to say in general semantics, the map isn't the territory. So our language isn't the actual things of the world. And this is something that, that uh, you know, Watts talks about in, in the book. Yes. You know, that again, it allows us to understand the world, to talk about it, to control it in some ways to our benefit. But it is also based on an alienation in the sense that the word is not the thing. Yes. And the thing about our words is that they are general, by and large, and it's hard for them to reach the same... Well, it's almost impossible for them to reach the same particularity as actual experience. I mean, we could get varying approximations of it, 
but the word isn't exactly the thing. So there's always a degree of abstraction and detachment. Um, I mean, in general semantics, what they used to advocate was this kind of thing called indexing. So, you know, if I were talking, uh, if I were looking at two dogs and using the word dog, they would have dog one and dog two, you know, so it was like indexing to to alert the language user that they were still not, the, you know, that while they, they fitted under this general concept, they were also individuals, something that could get lost yes. when, we, when we immerse ourselves in words. I think, yeah, I think that's an important point to, to make, actually, because you're quite right. The... Um, what what's his take on language? Which, as you've described, obviously that kind of way of of looking at it is, is something that others have, have written more extensively about. But it is quite fundamental, actually, to his outlook because, as you say, everything because for, because he wants us to be in the moment and to be present, yeah. and words are signs that point to things rather than being the things in themselves. You know, then yeah, if we're too much abstracting or we're just too much in the realm of thinking about connections and patterns and so on and other kind of more linguistic things then yeah we're, we're we're not doing the right thing as far as what's is concerned at least part of the time you know that that's something that has its yeah. place for him but but yeah we need to be aware that the language isn't the thing actually and that we're, we're well not. yes yeah I, I think that if we were to look at it in metaphorical terms again what Watts is cautioning us regarding language is that if we get too caught up in in words we end up um, just looking at menus, but never tasting the food. Yes, exactly, yeah. And yeah. this is something that he wants to remind us, that, again, is that we need to, it's almost like an empiricist point of view, we need to put words aside at times and attend to what is there concretely in front of us. Yes, that's right. It's funny. I'm sure in one of the, because the, there obviously there are many, many hours of talks with Alan Watts that are available yeah. online, which are really interesting. And I think there's one where he actually talks, he makes the joke that he anticipates in the coming years, people will start eating menus because they're so confused about the difference between the Does words he? and the food. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah he, makes that, right. he makes that okay. comment. And I th yeah, and, and, and I think that's it, because I think on some level, that's what people are doing without realising it some of the time when they're just so lost in right. thought. Right, yes. Okay. You know, there's, there's that, yeah. that failure. Well, um, I, won't, I won't make the claim that I've channelled them at that point or anything like that. It was just purely a coincidence. Uh, I just yeah, want to reassure people I'm not going to make the claim that, that Watts was talking through me at this point. You are now connecting that, that much with him. Well, I mean, we'll have to see as this talk, as this goes on, perhaps. Yeah, I, I don't want to set up a, an expectation and then people to be disappointed on that. No, no that's a good clarification. Yeah, yes, just, to, we'll... just to make it clear to people. Yes. <laughs> So the second question, obviously the, the, the title of the book, The Wisdom of Insecurity, the, there's um, reference in it, I think, to was it a W.H. Auden poem about the age of anxiety yes, that, what, yeah. that Watts refers to. So uh, what, what do you see then as the, ma as the maladies that, that Watts thought had created an age of anxiety? And how much are those kind of prevailing anxieties likely to have actually worsened since his death, since the time he was writing? Yeah, when, when I was reading that bit in the, I think it was the first chapter, wasn't it, where he was talking about the age of anxiety? Uh, yeah. I had, I had this suspicion whether I'm, whether I'm right or not, that he was probably influenced by Nietzsche. Um, okay. And what I mean by that is that, you know, Nietzsche had this view that because God was dead, as, as he proclaimed, that we could no longer anchor ourselves in any kind of worldview that uh, promised us that kind of security. And what he meant by security was a level of being, you know, something that was unchanging, something that, that could anchor us in whatever shape or form, and that what we were left with was simply change itself, really. So what, what I think what Nietzsche was you know, saying had ended was this idea that there could be a heaven, say, as the Christians might see it, or a yeah. platonic realm of ideas or forms, as Plato might see it. But, you know, this world that was static, that was unchanging, and that was the real world underneath or over and above this world of becoming. 
Yeah. Um, and I think what Watts was saying is that because of science, because of, um, you know, the religious doctrines being, being seen as less credible, that what we were left with was this insecure world, this world where there was no real foothold in it. You know, there was no kind of stability yes. or permanence and that this had created an age of anxiety. Um, I mean, I, I suppose his, his uh, you know, most profound claim in this book is that actually this is a good thing, that mm -hmm. we wouldn't want that permanence, even if we could have it. And uh, But it does make people, typically make people anxious because they, they feel like they've got no security. They've got the, the ground on which they stand uh, it just falls away from them. And so it makes them anxious. I mean, that was my sense anyway from that first chapter. Yeah, regarding absolutely. That age of anxiety. I think you're right. I think you're definitely right about the Nietzsche link there because there's no doubt. I mean, he sees that. I mean, it's interesting that he was a, a you know, a, a religious, a, a pastor or a priest. I can't, I can't remember specifically what the the job title he would be, but he was he was Christian and 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 for a period of time and and, a, and sort of having a congregation. But yeah, he's religious in a very in a slightly unusual sense, certainly in an orthodox sense, whereby yeah, he's he's very. Um, acknowledging of, of the, the impact of science on religious certainty. And as you described, he, he feels like that's been removed so that people no longer believe they're going to have any kind of permanent being in, in a sort of afterlife. So that's definitely part of it. But as you say, it's a really interesting thing about Watts is that he believes, well, one, that will make people more anxious, but two, that's actually almost like a growth stage that people should go through. And it's good if they go through it because he, he talks about the difference between faith and belief. Um, you know, the idea that faith for him is faith in life's impermanence, actually. This sort of, for him, this sense of being present actually is a religious act in a way. It's a sort of faith, but it's a faith where you abandon all belief and all certainty. So, yeah, I think that anxiety comes from the lack of religious belief belief in terms of you're going to survive death and so on but also the lack of any any actual belief in any ideology or anything else to give you that sense yeah. of permanent security it's like all that is ditched with him you know but of course the process of it breaking down causes so much anxiety for people you know when they they wonder yes you know, yeah um well i mean the, the the thing about the anxiety uh, uh, as you mentioned there is that um people are looking for some way to affirm, uh, you know, the continuance of the I, the self. Yeah. You know, this idea they're looking for some way to uh, believe in the continuation of their self in some shape or form. Yeah. And what he was saying, as you, as you pointed out, that science and such and grand narratives, as the postmodernists would say, of, of you know, fallen uh, there's no longer the sense of grand meaning uh, and so there doesn't seem to be a way to justify the permanence of the self and that that, that could create anxiety but i think what he's saying is that i don't really know much about this but i've read the odd book about what they call non-duality mm -hmm. so th and i think this is probably what Watts is uh, arguing for, because the non-dual perspective is that there is no separate I. In other words, there is no division inherently between self and world. In other words, you are, I mean, I think uh, Watts sort of says that when he says that it, there isn't an I meeting an experience, but simply the experienced. And that yes. seems to be a non-dual understanding. And if that is how he was seeing it, then the anxiety is actually a symptom of a, of a, a, a sort of a false self, you know, an alienated self that doesn't actually exist, you know, trying to maintain uh, the continuance of something that doesn't actually exist in the first place. Yeah, I think that's a. I, th I think I agree with your interpretation. I think you're right. He, um, I mean, this. The, it's difficult to know 
whether to use the word ego self or or just self per se when you're talking about what what's quite meant by the, yeah. the I that's fearful. But but yeah, I mean all all these security measures that we described previously or this mm. idea about thinking about past and future, all of that ultimately boils down to an attempt to avoid death of this of of the eye, whatever he quite meant by the eye. And but yeah, I think you're right. He actually thought that was a faulty belief um because for him um that that eye is is something of a, a construct something of an illusion an imaginative construct in some way yeah. that, that if we could only be present in the way he is advocating somehow we'd realize that eye isn't real but there's something else that's real and it's and it's a he, he definitely emphasizes the sense of interconnectedness you know that the idea that i think he talks at, at one point about the idea that the you know the oxygen we breathe in is as much a part of us as the as the body because one couldn't exist without the yeah. other and that in that sense you know there's that you know in, in all forms of life you can see how much the the environment and the organism yeah. are actually interconnected so he sees that as the fundamental nature i think of reality actually that it is just connection well um, yes yeah i mean this is something that um absolute idealists like uh, blanchard talked about they talked about internal connection and what they meant by internal connection is that if one aspect of it changes the other one changes too in other words that um there's no separation there's no distinction such that you could have change in one without change in other everything is internally connected to everything else so that would include our bodies and the oxygen that we take in it yes. would also include um our sense of self and the experience, they would be internally connected. In other words, you couldn't have a detached, overseeing ego that meets an experience. Instead, no. what you have is a self that is internally connected to each experience of the moment. And as the experience changes, so does the self. Yes. And, and, and what that I means so, is yeah. that there isn't, a self without the experience there isn't a self that um could be detached and be permanent um you know apart from these experiences i mean again this is such a complicated matter and i think you're right to look at there's maybe a possible distinction between the ego and the self because i got the impression that that watts was arguing that the self is always changing moment to moment and and I did wonder if at times he was overemphasizing change over yep. some degree of continuity I find it hard to believe that there's no continuity um to to be honest I think that's probably difficult to defend yeah philosophically I think maybe one of the potential weaknesses of this book is that he is such a powerful message to deliver that he might have um, slightly over-egged the pudding at times, or it might be that philosophically he believed that there was just change. But I think that's, I think that's a bit difficult to, to defend. I mean, you know, that there's no continuity because I mean, you know, say if somebody showed me a photo from 10 years ago, um, you know, and it was something that I could recall. I could say, well, that's me back yep. then. If yep. somebody showed me a photo of something that I wasn't there or couldn't remember, I couldn't identify it in that way. Um, I think there's only going to be a degree of identification if there's a degree of continuity as well. Um, I, I think so. I, I mean, but see, my take on that, I think I think that's a very valid point you make. And I think he's actually, he's unclear on that, on what he's, you know, the sort of idea of what is our, is there any innate self at all? Or is everything just pure interconnection? You know, is there something individual beneath, even beneath the ego level that's that's has continuity? And it's not clear from that book. And as you suggested, it's, it almost sounds like he doesn't think that. But it did strike me that, I haven't heard him give some of his talks mm. on things like Zen. Mm. He talks about the rhetoric technique of the Zen masters how if they want you to see a particular point and you believe the opposite mm. they destroy that and argue forcefully for the for the the most extreme yeah. alternative yeah. but really what they want is the kind of third way they want you to really see you know yeah. take up and, and I think for him I think he he certainly wanted people to be aware of this risk of of being stuck in an anxious ego state and, and to just yeah. actually try letting that dissolve whether or not he thought 
we are not we are nothing you know or we are just pure duality at the, the core of our being i don't know i think it's not clear in this book but i think you're right that is definitely a, well, a, a valid yes, criticism yeah. there that it's well i mean it, i think that i wasn't aware of that aspect of um you know the 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 provocative techniques of Zen to get us to, to be, I suppose they believe that we have to be jolted out of an ordinary sense of consciousness and to recognize, uh, you know, some underlying truth. And so, yeah, maybe he did present a more extreme or accentuated version. I think, you know, when I'm talking about continuity, just maybe the best analogy is that I can't help but see that the self is a bit like our body, in that obviously our bodies at five year old are not the same as at forty years of age, but there is some continuity, you know, in the yeah, sense of it's sure. in some regard it's still the same body, you know, and but yes. I, I think that the self maybe I'm making a duff analogy here, but I can't help but feel that there is some analogy there with the self, in that it's not identical. To, to the five-year-old self or the five-year-old body, but there is some continuity still. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, for for me, uh, if if Watts was was as you know, it took the most extreme reading of the self, and that there isn't really a self beneath it. There's just pure interconnection. I I, I couldn't quite see that as as making sense personally, but I, I suppose yeah. I mean, I, I'm obviously giving him a kind of more charitable. Yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm not. But it's unclear. Um, it is unclear, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Yeah, I mean, it could be that he is doing it to provoke, so that we can see a truth that is difficult for our egos ordinarily to ascertain. Uh, I'm, I'm in this sense. I'm not actually talking about so much what Watts's intention was overall, but more what might be the case. Yes, um, I think it's the case that you can still have continuity of sorts, even though everything is internally connected. Because if you think about Spinoza's idea of the body and of Canatus, this uh, drive to preserve our being. I mean, yep. Spinoza believed that everything was internally connected to everything yep. else, but he also believed that our bodies do try to maintain an integrity. It, it isn't an integrity that can be ultimately maintained because there's ultimate death, but there is also an integrity in the sense that it tries to preserve something, even though it is getting influenced by so many different things too. Yeah, it's a great point. I, th I think so. I think, yeah, I mean, it's such a difficult subject to speak about in terms of what would be at our core yeah. and be beneath. But but yeah, I mean, I think something like, yeah, this that idea about Canatus is, is, yeah, it's, it's hard to see, it's hard to make sense of what we know ourselves to be or what we, we think we know ourselves to be if there was no self at all, if there wasn't something, if there wasn't some sense yeah. of continuity at some level. I, well, I, I definitely think, agree I think, with you. Um, I think, you know, when psychologists talk about our traits, say like uh, the ocean traits, openness, conscientious, extroversion, agreeables, agreeableness, neuroticism, that yeah. they're kind of talking about a degree of integrity that our self has, even if it also changes over the course of our lifetime in some ways, just like our bodies in that, um, you know, say like... Um, somebody that is 20 years of age and then uh, somebody then that is 60 years of age, that their height won't vary that much. There'll maybe be some alteration, but they're not going to alter radically. There'll still be some integrity, some continuance there. And this is I what I think what Spinoza was talking about. Spinoza would actually agree with Watts in that he saw the ego as a fiction, an imaginative co construct. Yep. But I think where he might differ is that he would believe there was a soul, as he would see it, that had some integrity. So, and when I say integrity, I don't mean it in the moral sense of integrity, but more this sort of ability to, uh, you know, preserve itself somewhat through changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're right. I think the, the, the personality traits issue is an interesting one because obviously an extreme reading of, of say, what's, would, if, if he's suggesting that everything that's to do with the ego or the self is just this construct, then essentially if somebody was to become completely present and let that dissolve, it would be hard to explain why any personality traits would actually then 
kind of be consistent over time for that person. So in a sense, you're kind of stuck with the idea that if you have a consistent personality, you must therefore be neurotic, you know, in a way that you're yeah. unhealthy. But yeah, but yeah the Spinoza True. point would maybe suggest you could both, be, you could be authentic, you could maybe not have a particularly um, rigid ego, but still have a kind of continuity of your personality and other other. Well, yes, yeah. Well, I think I think the one of the the difficulties for Watts is that if you start to discuss or pause it, that there is some consistency to the self. So, for example, if somebody is high in agreeableness, see. Yeah. Then, as soon as you start to talk about these traits, then you start to have to think about, well, what kind of future is suitable to that person? You know, you, you have to think about planning yeah. because you're also yep. thinking about alignment between who you are and what would be good for you. If you see what I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. You have to yep. be a bit more future oriented if you start to think about aspects of you that are going to continue yes into the future so i think that might be another reason why he downplays that because if there was no continuity you could simply open yourself to the present in that radical way that he suggests whereas if there is some continuity you either want to to continue what is working for you or to build a life that will work for you yep it's true. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I think so. I think that's right. Again, a sort of unbalanced take on the on the embracing of insecurity. Yeah, could lead people down a a, a wrong road there. Where yes, yeah, I, mean, there I has think to be, so. Yeah, there has I to mean, be some yeah thought about future security, building on things, and so on. I quite agree with you. Yeah. I think well, I yes. Sense. I mean, it might be simply that I'm an unenlightened Westerner here, and that that I haven't experienced these fundamental point. But to, to me, what makes most sense about this focus on the present is about being able to enjoy the intrinsic value of the present. But I think that also has to be countered with also thinking about uh, planning in like the way Heidegger would talk about, you know, this idea of the self is also a project. Um, yes. And I think that's connected to, say, like our traits, our dispositions that psychologists talk about too. I think that getting a balance between the two is what I would connect more with psychological health. Um, yeah, definitely. I think so. I mean, I think, yeah, I think what's interesting about this this Watts book is that it is radical, you know, and it, it could be seen as a radical antidote to doing too much of, of as we described, the security focus. And I think that's what's really great about it for maybe yeah. a certain kind of person who maybe is an anxious person or an over planner or, a, yeah. you know, this is giving them the absolute opposite way to be. And I think, but I think you're right. A balanced person surely wouldn't be at either extreme. They, you know, and and it would. I don't think. I don't imagine even Watts himself in his own life really believed in abandoning all future planning or all all no. security focus to such a degree. I think it is very much a you know a, a yeah a radical antidote. Actually, this book perhaps you know that would be my kind of kind of thoughts. I think, uh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, he was obviously aware of how in modern society we're always planning. Yeah, and we're always focused. We're too focused on the future, and and in as far as he, what he was offering was a corrective against that utilitarian mindset towards the present. It's very very useful, yeah. but I think it has to be supplemented. Uh, I think with so. with th also an awareness that the future is important, that it that it does factor in to our lives and should. Um, yeah. you know, it should be an aspect of our lives because I think um, building and continuity is part of our, our lives. Um, it's yes. just if we overdo it, we end up turning the present just into a doorway into the next present moment. And then you've got this infinite corridor of doorways. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's it exactly. Yeah, um, I, I, th I think you know that this is something that 
you know, this this sense of an age of anxiety has probably prompted a lot of people to do. You know, I mean, there, yeah. there is there is a problem that people, you know, some people anyway, are, you know, lost in security concerns, think so much about the future that they, they aren't living. In. And of course, a lot of the, you know, the mental health issues that, that people have, which are so widespread now, it, it could be, it could be that, you know, what a what's reading of that, where you put that down to too much emphasis on trying to gain security, you know, might explain some of some of what's going on there. Not obviously all of it, but that might you know might might be a legitimate point that there is there is something about our society that does awfully make us think about the future and plan and plan and you know and that's maybe you know it's such a such a Western uh, way to be obviously. So maybe this this kind of dose of the the Eastern Zen you know is quite a good thing for us actually. You know that the Eastern well, it Eastern. is. Yeah. It is. I mean, if we think about anxiety, anxiety is inevitably connected to a notion of the future, an unwanted future, um, yes. some some threat that is looming at some point. So it's difficult to get anxious without the concept of a future. And so I think his solution to it was that if we immerse ourselves, if we open ourselves to the present and see our security of sorts in that and realise that there is no ultimate se- form of security in the future, then we don't need to worry so much about the future. And uh, I think that was his antidote to anxiety. I think where there is some kind of, you know, conceptual slippage really for Watts is that even if there is no ultimate security, there are still some forms of security <laughs> that you might wish to to consider and yes. try and build uh, too. You know, again, he, he, his concept of security is is um, a bit too metaphysical at times. Yeah, I mean, I I think I mean, yeah, I think so. I think I'm, I'm maybe a way to kind of. Th- think about it is that you know obviously we've talked you know a number a number of times about maslow and about you know obviously yeah. security needs are low down on the on his hierarchy yeah. of needs and so yeah but one of the good things about his perspective i suppose is that once your security needs are met to a certain mm. level then the reason you thrive is because you're no longer thinking about security yeah. needs so i think i think what's nice about the the what's antidote that could complement that is that he's i guess he's making the point that anxiety and insecurity are almost the the other side of the coin of security seeking you know if you're Mm. seeking security at least disproportionately you are inevitably anxious because you are currently aware of how you're insecure and trying to get more secure so you know there is obviously that yeah as you say when certain minimal security needs and future plans are in place which they have to be of course then yes certainly anything beyond that that's a fixation on security that is probably irrational is really, you know, about trying to get, maybe try to gain control in life where it can't be controlled. And, and almost by its nature, I mean, I don't know if you would disagree with that as a therapist. To me, it seems plausible that how could you not be anxious if you're trying to do that? If you're trying to do something to bring about more security than you physically can and you're thinking a lot about it, you'd have to be anxious if you were invested in that, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, because we talk about, security needs in that Maslow pyramid uh, yeah. structure that yeah he that was a good link to Maslow there and the the fact that they're lower down in the pyramid is not a thing about importance per se but more the primacy of security that we need to have a degree of security to open ourselves up to more nuanced or um, happier aspects of, of her life. But I do agree that if somebody was fixated on security and their security needs were not greatly imperiled, <laughs> then that would be, um, a, you know, a psychological issue to be addressed, yeah. And it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because, I mean, on the one hand, you know, it's a dis- difficult thing to contemplate, but, you know, we're, we're all finite beings. And so, you know, and that's something that's maybe not easy to take on board, but, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, we can never have security against that. And that's a hard, a hard pill to swallow, you know? So, so maybe, maybe, you know, maybe Watts has got a point that there needs to be a sort of working through the anxiety about our mortality, you know, that, that, that maybe, um, you know, could happen through, 
perhaps as he's suggesting more this this being present or just kind of contemplating the the truly insecure nature of our condition to some degree not to the point as distressing us but you know to no. some degree such that you know we can maybe you know not fall i suppose not fall into the temptation of letting the 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 you know the amygdala you know the part of our brain you know yeah. the, the part that's so super threat sensitive you know keep us thinking about safety 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 or, or security you know when we we really are on balance you know not in any real danger and of course never going to achieve absolute safety anyway you know that that ability to just kind of forget that and just not you know yeah. just let that be you know i guess well i think what, i think what um yeah i, th- I think that, that maybe a good way of framing this is a bit like um when i read about uh how uh this Heideggerian therapist saw uh, mental illness or psychological yeah. difficulties. And, and the way, you know, she put it is that, um, and she used the term neurosis, um, okay. but for her, the way she d- defined neurosis was when you took an ontological aspect and made it ontic. And what this is sort of like language that Heidegger uses. But what it essentially means is that ontological is basically fundamental aspects of our existence. So one of them would be uh, our finitude, for example. Yes. Yeah. Um, but for her, the way she put it is that neurosis is where you take an ontological matter and you worry about it as though it was a concrete matter and ontic matter so she gives the example of um you know uh, hypochondria right yes. that according to her hypochondria is where you take an ontological matter and you worry about it as though it's an aspect of your actual life uh, as if you could do something about it so for her a hypochondria is someone that that uh, you know takes the fact that we are finite that our bodies do have wear and tear and ultimately perish and actually then thinks they have to do something about that in their concrete life. So I think what Watts is saying is that, um, you know, there is no absolute security at the ontological level and we shouldn't try and search for it at the concrete ontic level because if we do it, we're going to have this neurosis, we're going to have this alienation, we're going to have this great distress and anxiety instead we should accept that that is a f- an inevitable feature of our existence and um and turn away from it and open ourselves to our actual life moment by moment exactly i think i think so i think that's that's a really um a, a really interesting parallel to draw there and and yeah i think so i think that the i guess the the good news is you know in the t- in terms of the we accept our simply our mortality, and, and that's that, and we we don't try to control it. But he he's suggesting that one of the things that happens, I guess, when you're more you do put that aside and you do reconnect with the present, is that you actually it doesn't seem like such a big deal. You know, this it's like the more a person's trapped in the ego mode where they're thinking about their security, the more they feel an isolated and increasingly fearful, vulnerable being. Yes, actually, yeah. But the more they're they're present, and although they're you know they're in, they're they understand intellectually their finite nature and so on they're just there is that um well he would argue f- whatever it may mean ultimately there is a sense of connection still in a sense of not not security in terms of permanence but a sense of safety in a in a in a in a deeper sense that they're okay with them you know being okay with yourself being okay in that moment and so on that there's you know you don't have a guarantee of permanence but you have you know but that's not necessary actually it's maybe not even desirable you know in that in that more um centered state i guess This leads on to that question about what he means by insecurity and yeah, yeah. why he doesn't see it as desirable. I think for him, um, this attempt at security, what he's really talking about is ontological security, yes. so absolute security, this sense of 
our existence being grounded in something that was not finite and was not changeable. It was something permanent. Um, so what he's saying is that if you see that as your definition of ins of security, then you're going to feel terribly insecure, really, there. Yes, I think what exactly. he's also saying is that if that's your definition of security, then you're going to be detached from life, detached from experiencing, because life is about change. It's about becoming. It's about variation. So if you're trying to lodge yourself in some kind of permanent residence or shelter, in his view, all you're going to be doing is detaching yourself from life, uh, feeling alienated, feeling isolated and alone. Whereas if you open yourself up to what he thinks is the only form of security we can have, which is being connected in the moment to everything else around us, then you have that security in that you're part of nature. Yes. You're part of um, what Spinoza would say was God, you know, that you're, you're recognising that you're part of God's body, so to yep. speak, God being used as nature here. Exactly. And I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, this same um, kind of false security that people can get caught up in and seeking and spend their lives actually seeking it. You know, it could be things like a, an ideology. It could be a, you know, a, a dogmatic religious viewpoint, or it could, e I, I wondered as well, it could even maybe cross over with some of the things that like Sir Karen Horney was looking at in terms of self-perfection, you mm. know, her kind of mm. neurotic on a, a, on, a, on this sort of quest for glory to realise their idealised self and all the things involved in that. Again, there would seem to be something about gaining an immortality in some sense that would be underlying a lot of that stuff you know driven by a fear of lot of of you know the self's vulnerability perhaps i don't know i mean i'm not well, I, again i think you know based on well yes i think you're right in as far as watts is right yeah again i want to you know i i would still see myself as an agnostic in as far as i'm not i think to fully embrace what watts is saying you would have to be an atheist Really, okay. I, I would imagine he was an atheist in as far as that um, he didn't believe in any kind of permanence or soul over and above this life. That's certainly the impression I got from his book. Um, maybe yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure that. about that, but I, I take your point. I mean, it's a very atheistic view in terms of he completely would bin all religious doctrine. Well, it belief. is, yeah. and, and, and also because of what we talked about earlier about continuity of self along with change that yeah I'm, I'm not sure if yeah I'm, I'm just not sure if if I could agree with all of it sure. um really there but but um certainly I could see from a mental health point of view the wisdom of um being open to the present I think that's yes. I think that is not controversial as far as I'm concerned. As to whether that is what our whole nature is, our whole being, um, I get the impression that the way that Watts writes about it in the book, that there's a greater certainty on these matters in his view than what I think there actually are. Sure. Um, I think the, these issues are much more complex than what he portrays in the book. And that's not me standing up for traditional religion. I just mean that there are so many philosophical debates about, you know, is the mind the same as the body? Uh, yep. And yet the way Watts writes about them, it's as if science is sort of showing that they are the same. And I'm sure a lot of people would agree with that, but I don't think necessarily that is the case or there's more of a debate, I think, in on that than what yeah. it might seem. Um, yeah. So I, th yeah, I mean, I think he presents a, a very powerful and cogent picture of how things might fit together. But, but I think there's, um, I think there's more subtleties and disagreements and nuances there than what he allows for. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and he I might, he might be right. He might be right. But I'm just saying, I think it's more complicated than that. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, the thing is, there is a, there's a slight sense of a sleight of hand with him, whereby he obviously he, he professes that what you need to do is, is dump all 
certainty, belief systems dispense with all yeah. that. But there is, but you know, and and although he sees faith as simply the absence of of a belief system of any kind of fixed yeah. values and so on, there there is still a bit of faith in the kind of more traditional sense of the word is needed really in order to quite take on board what he's saying because I, I mean he's he's suggesting that you'll discover this for yourself if you follow yeah. his kind of prognosis perhaps but but yeah there is certainly well a, there are yeah. assumptions there there are assumptions there, there are right? assumptions sort of, and and to me there almost seems to be an irony in the book in that you know he seems to be very certain about giving up certainty or giving up these notions so there does seem to be it's not dogmatism. It's not anything no, 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 that. But no. but on the other hand, there does seem to be a somewhat unreasoned element to it, in that you know the the, the level of conviction he has um, doesn't quite match the level of argument. Now I know that he will say this isn't just a matter of argument. It's also a thing of experiencing. Well, yes. that's true up to a point, but I think still uh, arguments or trying to justify positions are not without some use here. Yeah, it's, and, I mean it's it's tricky. I mean, I suppose he, you know he he will obviously would obviously take the view that as as we discussed earlier, um, he thinks there's a limit to how much of reality language can capture, and he's obviously suggesting a direct experience of it, which will you know, in a way, reveal the truth that we can only imperfectly try to chuck about in, in words. And and again, but again, of course, you know, yeah. w- well, I mean, we, we either have to take his word for that or or well. become extremely good at meditation and these kind of <laughs> pr- presumably Buddhist techniques that would, would reveal that truth. I mean, there, there is, that I is mean, kind of the argument often made actually by, by people that... that I, pr- think, you know, I think it is. And I mean, obviously I might get the fast track because I've channeled them tonight, as you, as you saw. <laughs> so well, I might that, be the fast track to enlightenment. But what I would say about that, you know, Stephen, is that, you, you know, there's that great book, The Nature of Thought, by Blanchard, and he argues in a very Western and very methodical way for the interconnectedness of everything, something that that uh, Watts would assent to in that sure. regard. And to me, I actually think that it can be argued, that interconnectedness. It could also be experienced, no doubt, on some level too. Yes. But again... I think he's maybe creating an unnecessary dichotomy there between thought and experience, if if you see what I mean. I think that yeah. these positions can also be argued for. I mean, I'm not sure if Blanchard ever experienced that interconnectedness like Watts, but he did certainly argue for it um, more thoroughly yeah. and convincingly, in my view. So I'm not really sure if thought and reality are as much at odds as he makes out. To be honest, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting point. Obviously, he, he, you know, he, because he's he has delved into the Eastern traditions and he really yes. loves the Hindu and the Buddhist perspectives. And I think he has got a point that you know there is something di- the Western perspective that does just simply look at these philosophical and spiritual issues in terms of abstract ideas versus the Eastern perspective, which is a more direct way to it but of course it's hard to say what the it is that there's a direct way to of course when it's not being done in the form of abstract ideas it's difficult it's difficult well you know? i mean so- the, the thing is that he's right that if if you were just addressing these things at the level of argument you might not feel it in your bones right at the level yeah. of experience and i mean i don't think that somebody like a blanchard or or a, a Westerner in general would disagree with that. I think, it's a, again, it's a necessary corrective. But what I'm saying is that we mustn't turn it the other way around and vaunt experience to the point that we don't believe that it's conceivable to also offer some arguments for yep. these perspectives. And you see that there is a, almost a kind of ambivalence in his book that at times he will go into a bit of argumentation Yes. for his perspective, and then you'll veer away from it, just saying, like, you know, but I'm not going to offer you this this ph- philosophizing about it. And, and again, he's absolutely right if we equate philosophizing with in- intellectualizing, but I don't think that they need be inherently opposites, 
really. Sure. I think it could come from both, really. I think they're mutually supporting. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think, like, for myself anyway, that if I had that sense of interconnectedness, and I think at times I have had that, <laughs> um, but I think also that if it's supplemented by a cogent argument, I feel I've got support from both sides, if you know what I mean, that they, they come together for me. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think, I mean, I suppose, and slightly in Watt's defence, I mean, I think he does say something in the preface, does he not, that he's he's tried to make this case in previous books, which I must admit I haven't read, where he's he's tried to use more kind of metaphysics and he's, you know, he's used philosophy and he'd, he'd come to the decision with this book that he didn't want to do it that way this time. Yeah, I mean, that, that's fair something enough. More, um, you know, yeah. I but that's fair so, enough, yeah. but, but what he also said is it would be like putting legs on a stake. So... You know, there's this kind of thing of, or, you know, he uses the analogy of tying up water, you know. That's right. And so, again, I think he's maybe overdoing it in that I don't think that argument and experience are opposites. I think they can mutually, and I mean, I'm not actually attacking him. You know, I'm not saying he hasn't got a point. What I'm just trying to do is round out the picture or at yeah. least what I think is a rounding out. Um, I think that's a fair prognosis. I, I agree. And again, I think that, um, you know, this book is a kind of ret- kind of interesting mixture of, of rhetoric and, and spirituality and, and a very yeah. kind of direct mental I mean, the, 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 thing, the but, thing is that clearly he was a great writer. Clearly yeah. um, he had a great intuition about many things. And and clearly also had some understanding of philosophy too. Um, but, yeah. but I think it's the thing of the rounded picture here. I'm trying to channel not only Watts, but Blanchard here tonight. <laughs> yes. and, and, and thinking that they need not be um, antagonists, really. Um, I, I, no, I, I don't. I absolutely uh, agree with you. Yeah, I think. I, I think mean, the, the thing is, actually, Blanchard's book is quoted a lot in non duality books. Okay. Uh, as offering a good defense of non duality. But again, not in the sense of consult your experience, but again, through rational argument. So, yeah. I, again, I don't think they need to be antagonists. And, and again, you know. If if we were just looking at the level of argument, you could say, right, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That could indeed be the case. But you might not feel that it's true. And I think like what Watts is talking about is that there's ways to know it in your bones as well. Yes. Yeah. But like exactly, for me yeah. but for me, I think that the most rounded pictures have both because um you know yourself, there's a lot of things we can feel in our vo- bones viscerally. Yeah. that might actually be illusory. Um, and so I think that's course, why yeah. we could also need argument too. Oh, no, definitely. No, no, absolutely, yes. I, th- I think um, I'm not um, going to side against you on the, uh, the, the role for uh, argument. No, I, I, definitely I think, not. I, I no, think no, no. that, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's not about me being hard on him at all or anything like that. It's just no, about, no. I think it's about, um, you know, for me anyway, putting it in context what he was saying and what what I think was of use for me or what spoke to me or what also I think might be the case anyway. I think so, yeah. I mean, yeah, because I mean, we were going to go on to talk about about the issue of, of you know, using yeah. these Zen and Eastern ideas within therapy. And obviously we've kind of been touching around that subject. Yeah. What, what, you know, what strikes me is that, um, I mean, obviously, Watts' his own life in terms of what we know about it was an interesting one because, yeah. it, you know, the, the method he's prescribing in this book to enlightenment, you know, and contentment and so on, you know, obviously, and I'm not I'm not trying to use this as a way to undermine his case, but obviously we know he, he ended up with alcohol problems and, you know, he yeah. didn't, obviously things in his own life were such that he wasn't able to completely you know, I don't, I don't really know. You know, I can't really comment on his psychological state and so on as time went on. But it would seem like he had, you know, his life wasn't wasn't quite the kind of zen picture, you know, that he's that he's painting here. Which no. to me, you know, doesn't actually. I don't think that undermines the case he's making, but it does maybe suggest it's a very difficult thing to do. You know, in terms of just actually, you know, remain so non security focused and to just be present in such a kind of you know, in that sort of yes, sense. So, yeah, you know, I, I mean, it's, I, I don't know what 
the ins and outs of his alcoholism were were to do. Obviously, he didn't live that long. No, and I don't know how that how much that was connected to him being an alcoholic. Um, what I would say is I saw a documentary about R.D. Lang. Oh yeah, the famous Scottish psychiatrist, and at one of his um, meetings. Uh, you see him dancing with Alan Watts okay. and sharing that moment together. And, I, and I'm and i convinced after reading the book and seeing that clip that Watts must have lived uh, his philosophy to a fair extent because there is that sense of being in the moment and communion with yep. R.D. Lang uh, that you see in that clip. Uh, he yeah. talks about life being a dance and he's dancing, you know, with... <laughs> R.D. Lang there, and, and, and it's quite touching, actually, in terms of the openness there that he must have felt um, to his fellow creatures too. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, we're, we're quite lucky, actually. There is so much... I, I mean, there's a, there's a limited amount of footage and an awful lot of audio recording of what, so yeah. we, we can get a really good sense of what his personality was like. Yeah. And he is a very alive person. There's no yes. doubt about it. He's a really charismatic. He's a you know a wonderful speaker. And I think you're I think you're quite right. I mean, regardless of the alcoholism issue, I think it would be unfair to him to suggest he's not at least to a very good extent li- living in the moment and yes. powerfully connecting yeah. with what's going on. I think that's undoubtedly the case. He do, he talks actually in some of his his um, talks about. You know, he, he does value appreciating the good things in life. I think he even yeah. refers to like a fine wine and this and that at various points. So he wasn't actually a sort of ascetic person in, in no. his taste, actually. That no. wouldn't really be um, his philosophy there, I guess. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. again, I don't know much about his life at all. So it does raise the question of how much he would have agreed to the diagnosis of alcoholism for one True. thing. True, Because yeah. he might have thought that it was part of the good life. Yeah. It was part of what he enjoyed. Now, whether that's true or not, it might have been what he believed. I'm not sure. But, yes, he has, um, even in the audio, he has a very rich, nuanced voice, um, very much alive yes. to oh, what yeah. he's yeah. talking about, uh, very much experiencing what he's talking about. Uh, he's not like one of those monotonic lecturers that have plagued too much of our own uni life. Um, you know, he's very, no, he he's, is very much alive. If he was like them, if he was monotonic, then we'd be starting to wonder, um, could he just write about this? And again, this is what he's talking about when if we overvalue thinking, then we might be able to talk a lot about things, but not actually be able to do them. Um, so I well, would exactly, say that at yeah. least in his defence. But yeah, as I, think I say, he... I want to add the corrective that that isn't to smear or downgrade argumentation either. No, 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 I, no, I agree. I mean, it's um, funny, he, he described himself quite famously as his vacation as a philosophical entertainer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like he can host what almost seems like a kind of a dinner party in a, in a lecture hall, you know, in terms yeah. of he's so witty. Apparently he didn't. He didn't have notes. He just, mm. he, you know, he could just speak, you know, in, yeah. in such a, as you say, such a fantastic voice, you know. And uh, yeah, I suppose in terms of the, you know, the, I suppose drinking alcohol, mm. you know, if it's something that you are being extremely health conscious about, you could argue that that isn't actually quite his philosophy, of course. You know, it is actually, you know, that's maybe too security focused for Well, yes, it might of, you be. Know, I mean, um, it might be that this, idea, you know, if you were too... I mean, again, it it depends on how much you see uh, veering away from what is traditionally called alcoholism as being health conscious. <laughs> it is maybe in an un- <laughs> understated way. But it might yes. be that, yes, he didn't want to um, conserve, really, or focus on those things, but rather just open himself up to what he enjoyed. Um, what and meaning for him again I don't know what the ins and outs of his alcoholism were I mean whether he he had to go into a clinic or whatever I don't know the ins and outs um, no, no, I'm not of sure that either, I mean no. the I mean R.D. Lang someone himself that was very much alive um, yeah. and very much focused on helping the mental health of others was also an alcoholic too yeah. Um <clears throat> I mean, the since we don't know enough about Watts, we can't, it would be 
I think, wrong to, to speculate too much. But what I would say is that him being an alcoholic, if we could call him that, how much that was connected to try to regulate difficult feelings. Because, you know, some people drink to escape from themselves. Sure. And there is that issue. Was that true for him? I don't know. But it just it would maybe we'll have to read a biography of him at some point. Yeah. But I think, but I think, but I think it's like how much was it escape? Or how much was it actually uh immersion in a life that he wanted to live? I don't know. Yeah. That's true. I mean, he, he emphasizes in, in, in the talks about, you know, the various the Zen masters and so on that he met that, you know, it may be contrary to sort of maybe Western expectations. You know, these people that are masters in these particular Eastern faiths aren't always saints. You know, there, there no. actually can be in some, I think he likes to emphasize the fact that they, they can be kind of slight sly rogues in a way. Um, and and he, he very much believed that you could be a little bit of a rogue, a bit mischievous, a bit, you know, indulgent, actually but still be very, very spiritual. You know, he saw that there is no contradiction there. It's a bit like maybe, um, you know, that's maybe a, a an important distinction to make, you know, whereas we're probably more used to the idea that a religious or spiritual figure is pure in some yes. sense. They would never taint their body with it, you know, that kind of idea. Well, but, I think that's, yeah, that's a very good point. And, um, you know, Gurdjieff, another mystic, yes. uh, was yep. someone that liked a good drink, was pres- promiscuous, was not a saint, yeah, but was seen by people anyway that were in his uh, circle as uh, spiritually evolved in many ways. But he was far from being a saint. He was not abstemious, Gurdjieff. And, oh, no, no. you know, Fritz Peters um, wrote an interesting memoir called, you know, called Gurdjieff Remembered about his experiences Uh with Gurdjieff, and Gurdjieff saw him as a spiritual son, okay. as his spiritual kin. And I can't remember, uh, which is annoying, but I can't remember the the phrase that Peters used at the end of the book to describe Gurdjieff, but it was essentially, um, you know, trying to capture that this, this person was uh, spiritually evolved, but also a trickster yep. as okay. well. So it was this thing of... Uh, both spiritually mature and a trickster as yeah. well. Yep. And this is maybe what Watts was talking about with these, um, you know, gurus or guides or mentors that he encountered too, that they are, I'm not saying that they say life or existence is a joke, but they do see a profound joke in it in some ways too. I think when we're talking about trickster or when Fritz Peters was talking about Gurdjieff being a trickster, that what he what he, he was invoking was not the idea that there were con men. No. What, not like the idea of tricking somebody, but what I think he was meaning is that tricksters are alive to this world of play, you know, like spiritual play almost, and that, that they're kind of walking a fine line you know, between, um, you know, being spiritually mature and, you know, becoming gurus or cult leaders. You know, there was a kind of fine line that he felt that Gurdjieff managed to walk. Um, I think also it's interesting to compare Watts to Gurdjieff because they're actually saying quite different things because, I mean, I'm sure... I, I suggested a few books uh, of Gurdjieff back in the day to, to you, Stephen, and you might recall yep. that Gurdjieff actually sees um, the spiritual evolution or development as a form of self-remembering. So Gurdjieff's view was that um, most human beings don't develop a soul, a permanent okay. soul. In other words, um, most human beings... Uh, develop a persona, a fake self, and they die without having developed the soul. But for Gurdjieff, it was this idea that through self-remembering in the moment that your actual self, your soul, could emerge. Um, so it's very different to what Watts was saying. Yeah, um, yeah. And this yes. it's very different because 
it, there was an attention to the moment, but for Gurdjieff, it was simultaneously attention to the moment while remembering yourself, because his view was that through self-remembering, the self starts to build up a continuity. Yep. And you get in touch with your actual authentic self, as he saw it, in contrast to this fictitious imaginative persona that people yeah, tend to have it. So it's very different to what Watts is saying. This is, I mean, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm harping on the point, but I think it, it is, uh, <laughs> I think it's still a good point to make, which is this is something that Blanche has said about mystics is that there's often quite contradictory perspectives, and this is another. Uh, argument or reason for having arguments and reasoning on these issues too yeah i think i mean what is you know what to me it sounds like you know that what whatever the Gurdjieff quite meant by by self and it's always a, you know the trickiness what's meant by the word i think what's maybe a bit unsatisfying about what's is that if if you think in some sense there's an authentic self to develop if there's something there that part of living the good life maybe in the way that maslow would have thought you know is involves something being developed cumulatively and sort of innate um, authentic qualities yeah. that are below the level of affect you know below the ego and you yeah. know it, it, what's doesn't really give you any of those and certainly in this book so there's not you know it could be it seem a little bit kind of demotivating in that sense well that it could it could you know, i mean there's actually been some interest and in connections being made between Gurdjieff and spinoza in that right. uh the persona is the ego the imaginative self and the the actual self as Gurdjieff saw it would be what Spinoza would see as the soul, something that had to be, um, you know, almost downloaded yeah. uh, into into your life, and otherwise you could just live this life of um, being determined by external causes, as Spinoza would see it. That's what Gurdjieff sees as the persona. It's 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 not your actual self. It's not self determination. And that's what Gurdjieff meant by the self, in yeah. contrast to the ego. So again, it's a different perspective to what, who's right. We're not going to certainly solve it no, uh, I don't think tonight. So. But again, it's just to offer a, another perspective, one that's very different. And, um, yeah. you know, and this is the thing. There are so many different systems saying different things. Um, and both of them obviously um, have spiritual credentials um i think so are. yeah i mean i think i mean it's obviously it's quite a kind of um you know well discussed point the idea that western civilization ha you know could could have a bit of a, a sense of spiritual dearth you know and that people whether they're ultimately you know formally religious or not you know that you know some people have argued that, that, that there is a spiritual dimension to our being that needs to have some kind of nourishment you know whether it, and it does not again necessarily mean in any belief in in afterlife or anything like that well but, no um, it, it does you know it, it doesn't um but but i yeah, mean i think what yeah sorry no no go on yeah I, th I think what Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff's perspective is sometimes called esoteric Christianity, in that it, it, it's this idea of a self, an underlying self. So I think he was believing that there was a soul, but this idea that most people didn't develop, uh, uh, didn't develop it for it yes. to to live on, and yeah. and so one of his famous sayings were, uh, "Blessed are those without a soul." Blessed are those with a soul, and cursed are those in the process of developing one. <laughs> That's a um, good one, yeah. <laughs> so I think it was this idea that there'd be quite a lot of suffering to yep. birth that self, whereas this is not uh, what Watts was saying. Very different, but both very interesting anyway. In terms yeah. of, like, the psychotherapy sure, perspective, yeah. I mean... Um, you, you know, as you'll be aware, there, there's a lot of books about mindfulness and mental health. Yeah. Um, and there's been a lot of research about the benefits to our mental health through meditation and mindfulness. Uh, it almost seems like stripping Watts's perspective really down, paring it really down to tie yeah. it in with that. But I think that's one of the most obvious connections between his book and current mental health, um, you know, 
I think so. I mean, or theories. I mean, one one thing that that strikes me that I think you know a what's you know and certainly in in his own personality kind of highlights as well is that I think sometimes mindfulness often it, it emphasizes the elements of quiet and you know maybe yeah. being in nature and meditate you know and so on and that of course is absolutely fundamental to it but there's also the idea about being present in company too yes you know the sense yeah. of actually being with another person and having it you know being tuned into them so i think that's maybe a, a flip side that's what you know that's probably you know important in terms of mental health as well actually, i think that's a very important point um, yeah. it's actually something that the gestaltists have looked at because as you know the gestalt therapy is about living the present yeah and you know i wouldn't be surprised if uh fritz perils and paul goodman and others that developed gestalt therapy were also influenced by the same perspectives as um as Watts. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I have heard that, that Perils allegedly met Gurdjieff at one point and was influenced by him as well. Okay. But, but this, you know, in Gestalt therapy, it's this idea that we have these needs, the needs assert themselves when they wish to be satisfied and they can only be satisfied in the present moment. Yeah. And there's one of the things that, that Perils talks about is this thing that he calls aboutism. So aboutism is when basically you cogitate or you verbalize, you talk about, say, your relationship with your dad. You know, you talk about it, but in Peril's view, that was really a waste in therapy. If you were talking about things, you weren't really living them, you weren't really experiencing them, and you weren't really resolving them. Because in Peril's view... If, say, you had anger towards your dad, if you were talking about it in therapy, there probably wasn't going to be much resolution. On the other hand, if you put your dad metaphorically in the opposite chair and spoke to him as if he was there, that you could then work through that anger in the present. And this yeah. is something that's quite similar to what Watts was saying, which is that if you open yourself up to that present moment uh, and feel it deeply, it will change. You will then Absolutely. not be the same person moments later that you were a few moments ago. And that's a big aspect of um, traditional Gestalt therapy. Actually. Yeah, that's a really that's an interesting parallel. I think you're right. I mean, I think that in a way, the essence for both of what good mental health is boils down to much the same thing there, actually. Because yeah, yeah. Um, that I mean, Watts definitely talks about the idea of dropping your 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 story, your self talk. You know, that the words you say in yeah. your head that that remove you from more direct felt experience. And obviously, people can do that when in company as well. You know, they can they might be talking to a therapist, but there's a there's a narrative as you suggested mm -hmm. that they're running through about a family member or whatever but yeah maybe there's something a lot more direct actually that can that could be a lot more effective in, well in, yes yeah you know, this is what of, they they do in yeah. gestalt therapy so say if a client was talking about uh, an upcoming exam or whatever something like that and their their leg was shaking you know uh, then they, they might draw attention to that so that the person can start to include that more in their awareness and become more aware in the present moment of what they're actually feeling. Because according yes. to the Gestalt perspective, the more aware you are of the present moment, the more that things can change. So I can't remember what Gestalt therapist... Um, it was, but he wrote a famous article about this notion that the more you accept the present, the more you're open to change. And I think what he's meaning is something that Watts talks about quite quite a bit in The Wisdom of Insecurity, which is the more you uh, immerse yourself in the present rather than being alienated from it through language or abstract thought, the more the feeling can change. Definitely. Yeah, I think, and I suppose on the plus side, you know, we talked about some of the limitations of Watts's view being so much emphasised in the direct experience part mm. without maybe the, you know, the support and ideas to, to, to justify it. But I mean, I guess both Gestalt and uh, Watts kind of offer a, a method there that can just be done. And, and obviously the advantage being that 
you know, as we know, when you feel more present, you do feel better. It feels like you're you're living in a a healthier way. Actually, the more you're able to stay present, well, absolutely. Definitely something, wh- whatever the reason for that or the deeper meaning of it is, that that seems to be intimately connected to good mental health. So I guess yeah, both yeah. are pointing us in that in that way. Well, it is, and I, I just want to return to that point you made about uh, good mental health and being present to other people yeah. in the moment, because I think this is connected to the I thou as well okay. you know yeah, something that Buber, martin yeah. Buber talked about but it's also something that contemporary gestaltists talk about the i thou uh, and the yeah. i thou could only happen in the present uh moment it, it's it's a it's you can only have communion and when i say communion i'm not meaning in the catholic sense here no, i mean no, in no, the no. sense of being together linked together connected together you can only have that in the present yeah, um, of course. I mean, there has to. Well, I guess the the difference being, you know, the I it the the boober, the more objectifying way of being with somebody. You literally have some kind of internal agenda for how that person, you know, what you want them to be in relation to you, what you want to get from them, or how you want them to see you. But yeah, I guess if all that's dropped and there's just openness, you know, there's no agenda. There's just a looking at the person and a and you know and and of course, a, you know, expressing what you feel in a in an honest way then it's a very different kind of communication, actually, that, that happens there. Well, it is, yeah. I mean, again, the I, it, which Buber doesn't make out is always wrong. Sure. Um, but but it, if it was used exclusively, it would be very wrong because if you were only using the I, it mode, so to speak, um, you would be seeing the other person purely in an instrumental way, yeah. you know, as a means to to your ends, which as Kant would say was the categorically wrong, you know, that you should never treat another human being merely as an end, um, but always an end unto themselves. And so the I thou is where you're open to the other person, uh, you're responding to them, they're responding to you. It's improv. It's not leading to some uh, preordained destination that you're manipulating it towards say yeah but uh, and so it's very alive and it's that thing of communion you know it is true communication because there is that communion of two people uh interconnect feeling that interconnectedness rather than this separate sense of self that is trying to uh manipulate um someone else that has not been given quite the status of a, an equal self. Yeah, I think I think you've described it well there. And it, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that the, um, you know, say mindfulness type experiences where people experience a loss of self, where there's just a sense of connection to the environment, you know, that can happen in company too. You know, a very strange experience of, of, of being connected but selfless you know a sort of strange yeah as you said communion is quite a good word for it actually and in, in that in that way that i think boober meant with the with the i thou um i think well, that's yes, definitely yeah. well i, I mean what you what you have is a, a sense of being oneself but also being a we you know yeah. like um being yeah. connected as well transcending each separate person into a third sort of um well, entity would be the right word because that's objectified. But you know what I mean? The relationship yeah. creates this third dimension yeah. of uh, that transcends each separate person. And I mean, if Watts is right and if Blanche is right as well, that's actually our reality. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's actually the reality of interconnectedness. But it's obscured by our egos, by our plans, by our attempts to master... Uh, situations and each other yeah um and so i think yeah. like one of the implications of this which is really important and is yeah. overlooked or not recognized because people don't know enough about this but if you go on youtube you will see tons of videos that are about how to become more charismatic, you know, how to become more confident. Okay. And I'm not saying that these videos are wrong. Of course, not. that again would be simplistic. But I think what we have to bear in mind is that if we adopt that approach too much in our engagement with our fellow human beings, we will alienate ourselves from that communion, you know, from that yes. I-thou. Yeah. Um, 
And exactly. so it's so important to remember that, of course, learning how to maybe come across more confident for a job interview, there's nothing wrong with that, but we mustn't overdo it. We mustn't see it as the fundamental way to engage with our fellow creatures. I mean, I guess it's again comes back to the faith idea in terms of as what's meant understood faith, faith in life. You know, you don't need necessarily the agenda of how you're going to be or speak to a given person. Uh, you know, in, in certain circumstances, obviously, not in all circumstances, you just let whatever's in you come out in that way. You just actually drop the story, drop the plans, and it's more of a kind of faith that there'll be a you know, there'll be some kind of connection will, will happen. And yeah, it's... Uh... Well, I, th I think the thing is that, yes, the faith would be the sense that um, if I open myself up, if I have this open heart to the other person and they respond, that that will be fine, that I don't yes. need to be involved in image management. Because exactly. I think the thing about image management, if it's taken too far is it's based on this sort of <clears throat> parochial view which is that I am fundamentally different to other people and and the only way that we can get on is if I create a favorable impression yeah so I think if we overdo that it's based on an alienation from each other which is no surprise in this society that this is rife actually yeah of course yeah um Whereas the I thou view is that somehow we can meet and it doesn't need to be staged. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to be overly staged. It can't be that that real meeting yep. uh, will happen. It can't be willed in exactly. contrast to image management. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's listen. It's 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 fascinating, and it's it's. I think it's amazing actually how we've, it's been quite a wide ranging discussion actually. Yes. You know, around uh, at the, you know these ideas that Alan Watts has put forward because I think they I think they do. I think but you know on the plus side, you know what you could say about maybe the lack of you know the fact that at times he's maybe a bit vague or it's not quite clear what he means. It does point in a lot of interesting directions actually, and it does orientate around you know what would seem to be a healthy way of being. You know, it does seem to uh, well, a absolutely. Lot of I mean, the, the uh, thing yeah. is that he has touched on a very important aspect, something that, you know, we need to be reminded of or become more conscious of. Yeah. And we've spelt, so. we've spelt out various dimensions of it. We've maybe also looked at where it could be supplemented by other views as well or where it could maybe be taken to an unhealthy extent as well. Sure. Um, yeah, that I think would be my perspective anyway. No, I agree. I think there's there's a lot of really interesting connections. And I think, um, yeah, I think the different, you know, we've, we've kind of covered Nietzsche and Blanchard and so on and Maslow. And, and they, they, there definitely are, uh, you know, very valid links there that, that kind of all somewhat point in similar directions to to some of what Watts was well Watts yeah was absolutely about. I mean I um, think there is a core yeah uh, uncontroversial aspect or message that he that he was um portraying in that book yeah I think so really yeah. there well I, I mean I guess I think wide-ranging conversation there Alex so I, I guess well, well, we, thank we, you, can, um, we can leave it at that for tonight but yeah thanks very much really, thanks, really that was great really, thank you really enjoyed that yeah thank you Thank you.